In John 15, 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Each week, the vine is a worship opportunity brought to you by St. Andrew United Methodist Church to help you stay connected to Jesus Christ, who is the true vine. We hope that you're blessed by our time together this week.
Hi, I'm Pastor Jonathan, and I want to welcome you to this week's segment of The Vine. We're going to be continuing our sermon series, Greater Things. But before we dig in, I want to invite you to reach out to me. You can contact me through our church's Facebook page, or you can email me directly at jonathan.wvumc at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to get to know you. I also want to invite you to visit our church's website. There you can find information about our ministries and opportunities there. And I also want to invite you to partner with us in ministry by financially supporting our church. And each and every time you do, you support our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I want to take a moment now to go to God in prayer. Let's pray. Loving God, we come to you now, thanking you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Thanking you for opportunities. Thanking you for new beginnings. Thanking you for the ways that you give us hope, joy, peace, comfort, and life. We come to you today to worship you, to give you all the honor and praise because you deserve it. And we come to you today asking that in these moments we would hear from you. That we would open up our hearts and our minds, even in the places that we may have closed off. Help us to hear from you and to respond with obedience and faithfulness. We also pray today, God, that we would be able to let go of the different things that are weighing us down. That we would be able to trust you with our burdens. And God, I lift each person who's listening right now that you would just make yourself known in their lives. They would sense your presence and know your love. And we pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand, and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you. And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, Just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. In the 19th century, a group of missionaries from New England were serving in the Pacific Islands. And upon their arrival, they were surprised to learn that the native women went around in public completely topless. Following their puritanical instincts, they 
contacted their network in the United States and said, send clothes immediately. And when the clothes arrived, they started to distribute them to all the women, teaching them about how to dress modestly, at least according to modern Western values. And then something strange happened. The leaders of that tribe approached the missionaries and asked, why have you made our women into prostitutes? And the missionaries, they were completely confused. They had no idea what the leaders were talking about. And then they learned that in the Pacific Islands, only prostitutes wore shirts. In her book, Expanding the Expedition, Rachel Gilmore tells about her experience in the Peace Corps. She talks about one of her teammates who was serving in Africa, and he was serving in a village where all the residents lived in mud huts. He knew that he had two years there, and he thought, in two years, I'm going to help each one of these families build a house out of cinder blocks. And that's what he did. It was a pretty ambitious goal, but he was able to accomplish it. And at the end of his time there, he was able to leave with a deep sense of accomplishment. Then he came back a year later to visit his dear friends. And when he did, he discovered that they were once again living in their mud huts. That the cinder block homes were nowhere to be found. And he was devastated. He asked what in the world had happened. And they simply explained that they liked living in the mud huts better. And this Peace Corps worker immediately regretted what he had done. He felt like he had wasted two years of his life that he could have been using for some other more fruitful project. I can share with you from my own experience. In 2016, I was living in western Greenbrier County following the 1,000-year flood. And my church became the very first resource center for our community. People from all over the state and all over the country were sending all kinds of resources to our community. They were sending buckets and mops and overalls bottled water, baby food, hygiene kits, and clothes. You name it, we were getting it. We were getting it in truckloads every single day, and it was leaving our church just as fast as it was coming in. It was really quite a remarkable operation. And one day I received a phone call from one of the leaders at UMCOR, which is our denomination's um, emergency response group called the United Methodist Committee on Relief. And they said, Jonathan, we just wanted to give you a heads up and let you know that under no circumstances should you accept clothing donations. And I said, okay, but can you help me understand why, if someone brings clothing, what I should say whenever I turn them down? And they explained that the first disaster was the flood. And the second disaster for our community would be bedbugs if we accepted used clothing. Just a few days later, trucks were pulling into our parking lot. And there was this big box truck that backed up to our door. The driver had made a trip 90 minutes each direction. He had worked tirelessly for days collecting clothes. This entire box truck was full of clothes. And I felt so bad telling him that we could not accept them. I explained that I had been specifically instructed not to accept these clothes. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, I brought them here and I'm not taking them back. 
So in the midst of trying to operate this resource center and having dozens and dozens and dozens of people in my community who were displaced and in this emergency situation, we had to bag up all of these clothes. We had dozens of trash bags on our church lawn waiting for the garbage truck to pick them up. It reminds me of a book that I had to read when I was in seminary called When Helping Hurts. And the primary idea is that sometimes we can try to do good things. We can try to help people. But if we don't ask the right questions, if we don't first work on building relationships, then we might actually do more harm than good. We might find ourselves in embarrassing situations. We might actually impede our mission. In his book, Toxic Charity, Robert Lupton explains that 90% of Americans want to do something charitable for others. And the primary reason is because it makes us feel good. And we all know this from personal experience. We like to do good things for other people because it makes us feel good. That is often our primary motivation. However, even with the best of intentions, our actions can have toxic results if we operate out of assumptions and lack of information when we don't have firmly built relationships. The author explains that positive transformation in communities must always begin with building relationships. When we begin with acts of service before we build relationships, we can make erroneous assumptions and in the process actually steal someone else's dignity. Think about that. When we make assumptions about the people that we're trying to serve before we take the time and the opportunity to get to know them, we might actually steal their dignity. We learned this concept or experienced this concept recently here at St. Andrew as we were trying to line up our small group uh, ministries with some form of outreach. We contacted our local food pantry and, and uh, kitchen and we said we'd like to send a group of people over to, to uh, serve, to work in the food line, to work in the food pantry. And they said, we really appreciate your offer, but we're actually inundated with volunteers. There are people who come and serve here all the time. We are overwhelmed with help. What we really need are people who would be willing to come and sit down and actually eat a meal with the patrons. And that reminds me that, yes, we like to do things that make us feel good. But the actual need there was to restore someone's dignity. Maybe someone who had been marginalized, maybe underprivileged people in our community who feel like they are often treated as less than. What they really need is for someone to sit down across a table from them and treat them as an equal, to treat them as someone who is of sacred worth created in the image of God. And when we first work on building relationships and making connections with people, then we can work towards helping figure out what the needs might be. And in the process, we discover that we have needs as well, that we need that relationship just as much as they do. Henry Nowen, who was a seminary professor at Harvard University, talks about how in his book, In the Name of Jesus, he describes how he kind of went through an existential crisis at the latter part of his career, that he was kind of in a dark place. He was an incredibly accomplished theologian. He had published books and articles. He was highly regarded. He had a great reputation but he felt disconnected from God. He felt like something was missing from his life. And so he resigned his position 
as a seminary professor. And he spent the rest of his life working at a home for adults who were handicapped. He was specifically assigned to a young man who could not cognitively process anything to have a conversation. He had to be fed. He had to be changed. And Henry Nouwen talks about how that in this process, this is what he needed. Because in those moments, he saw the living Christ. He had isolated himself from the world in the ivory towers of academia. And in this moment, he had the opportunity to serve in a real tangible way. And through this experience of working in a convalescent home, he was experiencing and witnessing the resurrected Christ. He was seeing Jesus by being in a relationship with other people. And we hear that in Jesus' words, this parable of the king. That when we do to the least of these, to those who are poor, to those who are naked, to those who are lonely, when we clothe them, when we visit them, when we care for them, what we do unto them, we're doing unto Christ. And sometimes it can be so easy to kind of just throw money at a problem. When we hear about different needs in our community, it's easy to, to just kind of say, here, see if this helps, without actually getting involved, without ever building any relationships. And, and don't get me wrong, because it's good to be generous. And a lot of times our financial resources can really go a long way. But when we do that, we're missing out on something so great. When we fail to engage in those relationships, not only are we making assumptions about the people in our community, but we're also missing out on the opportunity to witness and experience and encounter the living Christ in others. And Henry Nouwen, he explained in this phrase, he used this phrase, that the Christ in me sees the Christ in you. When we go out into our community and we build relationships with people, the Christ that is within us is able to see the Christ that is in others. That is what gives us life. That is what gives us hope. That is what gives us joy and peace. This week, you're going to hear from one of our small group leaders about their ministry, of how they're going out, how they're going into the community to build bridges, to make connections, to be able to see the Christ in others. Listen to what they have to share. Hi, I'm Amy Loftus. And I wanna share with you about our small groups outreach. About a year ago, Jonathan, Pastor Jonathan challenged our small groups to plan an outreach activity. We started of a list of things we could possibly do, but God kept leading us back to one particular mission, inclusion. Many people know that I have a son with Down syndrome and I am passionate about helping to make a way for him and others with different abilities. I didn't want our small group to choose our mission based on my interests alone, but God kept planting the seeds within each of us. We were inspired by our community project called On Purpose, a project of community inclusion of people of all abilities. In December, I was introduced to a nonprofit organization called Passion Works in Athens, Ohio. Passion Works is an art studio for all people, and specifically people with different abilities, to create art in a safe place and for a purpose. I recently visited the studio with Jeff and Adam, and the director said something that has remained in my heart and mind. Everyone has a purpose, 
and everything has a purpose. It was a voice, God's voice. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Ecclesiastes 3.1. Our group decided pretty quickly that we were ready, that the season is now. On July 13th, we had our first outreach called Art for All. Art in all forms is subjective. There is no right or wrong. Art speaks to people in a way that their own op opinions and experiences influence. The same goes for making art. Anyone can make it. And again, there is no right or wrong. Art is therapeutic for many. It's a quiet time to focus, relax, and just enjoy the outcome, even if it's not exactly the way you pictured it in your mind. Art is a work in progress. And I wonder if God thinks the same of us, his masterpieces, not quite finished, but a work in progress. Since July 13th was our first attempt, we decided to invite our church, but also members of the disability community, including our SNAP class here at St. Andrew, on purpose members, some local families with loved ones with special needs. Our purpose for the first event was art for all, all ages, all abilities, and no art ne experience necessary. We looked for ways to adapt to all needs, and it felt like another nudge from God having teachers, an artist, a speech therapist, an occupational therapist, and counselors in our small group. We worked together as a team. There were even a few that fell out of their comfort zone, but contributed and gained confidence in a new experience. There was a communication board for those participants who were limited in speech or nonverbal. There were tools to use to help with painting for those who had limited control of their hands or small motor skills. Our first event was painting on canvas with acrylic paint. And when our artist, Debbie, said, no rules, just create what you want, I knew this was going to be an interesting and exciting time. We were so amazed at the results. Some used special crayons dipped in water to paint. Some used sponges for texture. Some used brushes of different sizes. And oh, there were so many colors to choose from. The next hour brought many smiles to faces and proud moments of sharing artwork. One young man said, are these going to go into a museum or something? Hmm, maybe someday. Everyone had a purpose. At the end of the event, looking through pictures and reflecting on the evening, there were 48 people coming together to create art, no rules. The age, per, the age range of participants was three to 80 years plus with every generation represented. There were 11 people there with disabilities. There were 14 who had not been affiliated with St. Andrew before. And many more were interested in attending, but on vacation. So we are sure to have a few different faces at our next event. Diversity is a fact. Inclusion is an act. Jesus was inclusive of everyone, and our hope is that we can do the same. For our upcoming events, we plan to do diff a different form of art each time, which could include paper collage, ink printing, paper marbling, tie-dye, quilting, watercolors, oh, the possibilities. Maybe you are thinking of an art you would like to share with our group. In Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. We welcome you to join us on August 31st for our next event. Everyone is welcome. Our small group members are Karen Bradley, Susan and Ted Danford, Debbie Ellis, Rebecca Handley, Norma King, Amy Loftus, Melanie Ogu, Kathy and Roy Smith, and Sarah Sturm. 
If you're interested in coming and participating in Art for All, you can contact one of us. Thank you. It's so important for us to be generous. It's so important for us to use our resources to bless others. But I believe that God is calling us to have a greater understanding of our community, to have a greater understanding of the needs of the, the people who live right around us. And the only way that's going to happen is when we're willing to step outside of our comfort zone to build relationships, to stop making assumptions, but to sit down and enjoy a meal with others, to allow the Christ in us to see the Christ in them. I hope that you'll continue to pray for this small group and their mission and ministry, as well as the other small groups that you've heard over the last few weeks. And I hope that you also take some time to consider whether God is calling you to join them. If this is the place, if this is the opportunity for you to serve and grow in your faith. If you're interested or if you have more questions, don't be afraid to reach out and contact us. Let's pray. Loving God, in these moments we are humbled by your Son, Jesus Christ, who did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, humbled himself, and he clothed himself in the form of a servant, joining us here. May we follow in his footsteps, the one who sat at the well of the Samaritan woman, the one who sat at the table with sinners, the one who is here with us now. And may we see him and discover him in the lives of the people around us. And it's in Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen. I hope that you've been blessed by our time together this week, and we hope to see you next time. Take care and God bless.